The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Gamaliel was a most respected Pharisee. Gamaliel was also a celebrated expert on the topic of the Mosaic Law, the Law of Moses. He was also a member of the Sanhedrin, which was the highest court of law for the Jews themselves. And according to the inerrant sacred scriptures, St. Paul the Apostle was actually educated in the religious law by Gamaliel. Tradition tells us that Gamaliel eventually embraced the Catholic faith and that he was literally baptized by St. Peter himself. And furthermore, it is well known that Gamaliel was courageous enough to bury the body of St. Stephen the deacon, the first martyr, after he was stoned to death by the Jews. Now, the reason I mention this wonderful saint today is because of an incident that happened in the Acts of the Apostles. In the Acts of the Apostles, it is said that Peter and other apostles were being prosecuted by the Sanhedrin for continuing to preach the gospel of Christ despite having been forbidden to do so by the Jews. The passage describes Gamaliel arguing against killing the apostles, reminding that the Sanhedrin that oftentimes such religious movements in the past have proven failures anyway. Let the apostles go for now, in other words, and see what happens to that movement of theirs. Gamaliel's concluding argument in the Sanhedrin is famous. He stated to the Jewish elders that if this origin, this movement, be of human origins, quote, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye will not be able to overthrow it, lest perhaps ye be found even to fight against God. If this movement be not of God, but of human origins, it will come to naught. On today's Holy Gospel for the Mass, our dearest Lord gives a parable, a parable of the mustard seed being compared to the Catholic Church or the Kingdom of Heaven. For a farmer back in those ancient times, the mustard seed was the least, the smallest of seeds. But when it grew up, it became greater than all the other herbs, becoming like a tree that was big enough, big enough so that birds could literally dwell in its branches. Nothing was more small in its humble origins than the Roman Catholic Church. The very founder of the church, namely our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was born in a humble stable and placed in a manger. In the first 30 years of our blessed Lord's life, our Lord was largely hidden and small in the eyes of men. He then entered into a short public life of three years in which he preached a gospel so wonderfully simple that even little people could understand and after his burial, his death, his brutal death, his, the burial, followed by his glorious resurrection and ascension, our Lord left the visible work of maintaining the church into the hands of insignificant, simple men known as the apostles. And yet within a short time, historically speaking, this little seed became a gigantic tree spreading and thriving throughout the entire Mediterranean world and beyond. The gospel of our dearest Lord is not always impressive to the eye at first. There are bigger seeds in some of the complex and high-minded philosophies of men. And yet, when the seed is planted, when it's sowed, the results are quite different. The impressive seeds of men and their thinking yield little, while the seed of the gospel sown by Christ the sower flourishes in good soil, bringing forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. The omnipotent God that we love worked through the preaching and miracles of the apostles and those Catholics who followed them. This witness, along with the love and the moral courage of the first Christians who were willing to die for the truth, proved the divinity of the Christian religion leading many pagans to leave their idolatry and to embrace the gospel. Now, it is true, you might say, 
What about all those false doctrines? False doctrines preached by men like Muhammad, as well as the erroneous teachings of Luther, Calvin, and all those Protestant revolutionaries. Didn't they spread quickly too? But this should not be surprising that false teachings spread quickly as well. For it's easy to lead people to a doctrine that encourages carnal sensuality, satisfy the flesh. It's easy to promote a religion that promotes earthly power, that excuses men from living a life of holiness and purity. It's easy to preach that. It's always easy to spread a message that encourages ease and promotes decline. But it's more difficult to preach a message that demands sacrifice, love of one's enemy, and climbing upwards. Despite the fact that the true religion of Catholicism preaches Christ crucified, along with subduing the flesh, detaching even from the legitimate pleasures of creation, and utter obedience and conformity to the divine will, that seed of the gospel forever spreads and expands the kingdom of heaven. And when the gospel, our dearest Lord, uses the mustard seed to show the small beginnings of the Catholic Church. But in the book of Daniel, the imagery used is a small pebble, similar idea. In the prophecy of Daniel, we are told of Daniel's gift of interpreting dreams. And one particular dream Daniel interpreted was that of the dream of the Babylonian leader, King Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember from the scriptures, Nebuchadnezzar dreamt of an enormous statue constructed of various materials, with the statue's head being a pure gold, the chest and arms of the statue made of silver, the belly, the thighs of the statue made of bronze, and the legs of iron, and the feet partly iron and partly clay, a mixture. Then in this dream that Daniel interpreted, a rock, a pebble actually, a small pebble, is cut from a mountain by the hand of God, and it falls upon the feet of that statue, breaking them into pieces. Then the iron, clay, silver, bronze, and gold all together are broken into pieces, and they become like chaff that the wind carries away. And that little pebble, cut by the hand of God, then becomes a great mountain and fills the entire earth. And so with divine enlightenment, Daniel explains the various secular empires and worldly kingdoms symbolized in the statue that are bound to fail. The church remains. All these famous empires fail and fall. But eventually, Daniel prophesizes about the church. He says, quote, The God of heaven will set up a kingdom, his kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. This kingdom shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. But his kingdom shall stand forever. And what again is Daniel speaking of? We know he is speaking of the Son of God, the stone rejected by the builders that has become the cornerstone of a new temple, the holy temple of his body, the kingdom of God on earth, the holy Roman Catholic Church, which is also built upon the pebble, the rock of St. Peter and his confession, a kingdom that will last forever for even the gates of hell. Not even hell can bring down the kingdom of the church. And this stone, Christ and his Catholic church will grow. And they will become a great mountain covering the whole earth, providing both Jew and Gentile the one and only connection with the summit of heaven. Yes, Gamaliel's observation made in the Acts of the Apostles proved to be so very true about Christ and the Apostles. Because if this movement be of human origins, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, he will not be able to overthrow it, lest perhaps he be found even to fight against God, unquote. Now, last Sunday, I asked you to offer up a prayer or two, and perhaps even offer a sacrifice, a penance, for the sake of our meeting with the new bishop of the diocese. I thank you for your kind prayers and sacrifices. 
The meeting went well in many ways. The bishop is obviously a kind individual, very affable, very jovial with a hearty laugh. He was genuinely interested in our parish and its success. At the same time, however, the bishop was also uncertain, as many are, about how things will play out over the months to come regarding the motu proprio, known as traditionis custodis. We need to thank the good Lord. We need to thank the good Lord that our new bishop, so new to his job, has not written and probably will not write any document about the implementation of the motu proprio. And thank goodness, don't any of you write to him asking for clarifications, because you might get a no. Because I've read about some of the restrictions already. I've read about other dioceses throughout the world, and these restrictions in some cases are draconian and brutal. We have seen canceling of masses, and even the complete removal of traditional Latin mass from various parishes for good. We've seen the limitation of the old mass. No masses during the week. No old masses during the week. Perhaps not every Sunday now, but only maybe once or twice a month. And of course, there will certainly be less access to other sacraments. Perhaps a request granted here and there. But basically, all Latin mass masses and sacraments will be restricted just to Latin mass parishes and chaplaincies. And of course, what's going to happen to seminaries? By and large, they will shut down all training for the old mass. And seminarians who have a conservative traditional bent will probably fear even to talk openly about the old rite and the old faith in the open. And shocking news that some of you may have read about. Shocking news came out recently from the Diocese of Rome, the Mother Church. Although the Latin Mass is still allowed in very limited ways in that location of Rome, a celebration of the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, is forbidden in the Old Rite. And worse yet, all liturgical books before Paul VI and the reforms of Vatican II are now forbidden to use. In particular, the Roman ritual, that book which every traditional priest has on his shelf. The Roman ritual with the ancient rites of baptism, extreme unction, as well as all those sacramental blessings of holy water, all forbidden to use in the Diocese of Rome. I'm not sure if one can even fulfill one's duty in reciting the breviary if one chooses to use the old breviary. Is it still valid? You see, what does the text of Traditionis Custodis ultimately aim for? All pre-Vatican II liturgical texts are to be highly regulated as the planned permanent shutdown occurs in the years ahead. And of course, as always, that litmus test <laughs> demanded of anyone who might even desire to celebrate the old rite that they not deny the validity and legitimacy of the liturgical reform dictated by the Second Vatican Council and the Magisterium of the Supreme Pontiffs after the Council. Not any sort of adherence to Vatican I, <laughs> not a demand to adhere to the Council of Trent, not a demand that we submit to the teachings of Council of Florence or the Council of Nicaea. Only one council, one liturgical reform, must be submitted to. The prefect, this is a difficult thing to read. The prefect of the Sacred Congregation for Divine Worship, he's in charge of the sacraments and the mass, the liturgy. A man named Archbishop Roach makes it clear for all of us what the goal ultimately is. In a written letter, by Archbishop Roach, Prefect of the Congregation for the Divine Worship, it states, quote, that the Pope ultimately desires a unitary liturgical practice using only the reformed liturgical books, Paul VI forward. That's the one unity that is desired in the Latin rite. The bishop, Archbishop, I should say, continues, quote, the reformed liturgy, 
Paul the Sixth liturgy, is intended to be normative, the norm for all. The Archbishop adds that, and this is supposed to be a note of mercy, he adds, quote, a certain delicacy. Be delicate. A certain delicacy or pastoral prudence may be required for a very limited time only until there is full implementation of the motu proprio. But this unreformed, we have an unreformed liturgy, the ancient, most ancient rite in the history of the church is unreformed, we're told, is at variance with the conciliar reforms. That means it's at odds with the council. The archbishop then makes an extraordinary statement that seems so at odds with what we have heard in the past. He claims, quote, the pre-conciliar liturgy, the mass before the council, in fact was abrogated by Pope St. Paul VI, unquote. Here for 14 years, we were told by Pope Benedict that it was never abrogated. In fact, it can't be abrogated. That's not the thinking of the present prefect of the Congregation for Divine Worship. In short, then, the traditional Latin Mass is no longer part of the Lex Orandi of the Latin Rite. It's no longer the way that we're supposed to pray. And so the Mass of St. Damasus, the Mass of St. Gregory the Great, the Mass of St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Margaret Mary, St. Pius X, and even up until Pius XII, and John XXIII, and the Mass that they said throughout the entire council, it's no longer acceptable. And if the old mass no longer reflects the law of praying in the church, you wonder if the old faith no longer reflects the law of belief for the modern church. In a way, then, the traditional Catholic faith and the ancient mass and sacraments are to be compared with the mustard seed, especially now. The old mass and sacraments are now seen as insignificant, unimpressive, hidden some corner, put on some dusty shelf, unappreciated by the elites as it's off in some ghetto. For decades now, the Novus Ordo Mise has been the dominant seed. But has this impressive seed borne fruit? Has it stood up in the adversities, especially in modern times? Has the church grown in the West since its introduction? Has there been a springtime where Catholicism has flourished in this new direction, new orientations? The simple answer is no, thank you, it has not. There has been little to no fruit or even bad fruit from this seed. Pews emptying out, churches closing down one after the other, Catholic schools and seminaries closing their doors, 50% less ordinations, far less priests, far less religious sisters, a dearth in vocations, more divorces among the faithful. And yes, Catholic presidents, Madam Speakers of the House, being welcomed at the altar, the table of the new Mass to receive sacrilegiously, regularly, weekly, the Eucharistic Lord. All are welcome. But as for that small seed, the smallest of all, of the old Mass and the old faith, its size at this moment may be unimpressive, but it will grow. And it will restore the church and it will help the church flourish and it will become a mighty tree and a mighty mountain that will encompass this earth. It is the seed, the mass, and it's the faith that will not die. And it will triumph in the end, guaranteed. 
to paraphrase St. Gamaliel from the Acts of the Apostles, if this traditional movement be of human origins, it will come to nothing. But if it be of God, ye will not be able to overcome it, lest perhaps ye be found even to fight against God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.